Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this uh, year-end webinar. So this uh, type of webinar are the European Rewilding Network intro webinars. And these are uh, opportunities for the members of the European Rewilding Network to promote the work and showcase the work that they've been doing, um, which is all, of course, related to rewilding. So we're very happy to have Helen and Helena here from Saving Wildcats. And um, just for those who are not uh, a part of the European Rewilding Network, because we have quite a few people here that are external, um, our network right now consists of 89 rewilding initiatives. And we have many more, honestly, in the pipeline that are about to be announced. The last two ones that were announced were uh, restoring water bowl populations across Cornwall from the UK, and also the Pentasog uh, project, which is in Hungary, which was our first Hungarian project. And you can see in this map uh, that we have uh, rewilding initiatives all across Europe. And um, the European Rewilding Network is a community of all these organizations and initiatives that are working on rewilding across the continent. And some of the benefits that the members receive are uh, these open webinars that you're a part of right now, and also some closed webinars that are learning opportunities that are given by specialists. Also the Rewilding Europe Capital, which is a loan facility for rewilding businesses. Uh, on another hand, there is the, re the European Rewilding, no, the European Wild of Combat Fund, sorry, which is actually something that um, Saving Wildcats has received a grant from, which is specifically for um, introducing species, keystone species. And lastly, there is the networking and learning from other rewild initiatives, which sometimes includes some in-person events that we hold. So that's the very short summary of who we are. And today I am presenting uh, Dr. Helen Sen, who is the Head of Conservation and Science Programs at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Uh, so thank you so much for being here and for uh, talking to us about the work that you do in Saving Wildcats. And also we have Helena Parsons, who is also here from Saving Wildcats. And uh, lastly, there's me, <laughs> who you, many of you already know. So I am the coordinator of the European Rewilding Network, and my name is Julia Mata even though I see now my tag is Rewilding Europe, very, <laughs> uh, but I am, that's my name. For those who don't know, the agenda is very, very simple today. So we will start with just this very short introduction that I'm giving you right now. Then we'll let Ellen explain all of the things that, all of the exciting things that they've been doing, um, which I think we're all really looking forward to. And then lastly, we will have some space for you to ask questions and, and we can answer them. Um, so we will use the Q&A function in the bottom of Zoom for that. And I will read the questions and read them to Helen. So that's, that's how we will do it. And then we will just have a bit of a closing off. This should take around 30 minutes. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for everyone to be here that are here and also thank you to Helen and Helena for sharing with us the work that they do. Hi, thanks, Julia. Thanks so much um, for that great introduction. Um, just a moment while I get my screen sharing sorted, the inevitable technical issues. Um, yes, yeah, so welcome everybody. Uh, thanks very much and welcome from a very chilly morning here um, in the Scottish Highlands. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you about the Saving Wildcats project. Uh, you know, thank you so much for the European Rewilding uh, Network um, for supporting us uh, through the, the Comeback Fund. Um, it's really great to be part of the, the network and, and part of uh, Rewilding Europe. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll just give you a quick whistle to stop tour of um, some of the work uh, that we're doing. So this is one of the first Wildcats um, to be released uh, back to Scotland. Um, with the support of the European uh, the European uh, Comeback Fund uh, this year. Um, and I'm just going to tell you the story about how we got here. Um, and we're a partnership project. Um, we're supported by the European Union, um, which is really great, um, and uh, a, a wide number of organisations. Um, and uh, Rewilding Europe um, very kindly um, came in to support us on the, the collaring of the, the cats that have been released. So what is a wildcat? 
Well, um, I think you're probably all familiar with wild cats. It's a medium sized um, cat species that's found across large parts of Europe. Um, in the UK, they're critically endangered um, and the threats are habitat loss, um, persecution and hybridization with domestic cats. Um, and a review in 2019 um, declared that the population was not viable without um, additional help, which was particularly help uh, through releasing cats. Um, there are, this is what wild cats look like. I'm sure many of you um, are familiar with them. Um, uh, a, a brown and black stripy cat, um, very char charismatic and feisty. Um, and particularly when we're thinking about the restoration of a carnivore species, it's really important to think about the underlying ecology. So what do wild cats need? Well, they need um, high quality mixed uh, forest and grassland habitat um, and that supports what they eat and what they eat is uh, small mammals um, in the case of um, the Scottish population that's voles and rabbits um, and uh, mice um, and that, that, that that's the habitat that will really support um, a good good wildcat um, populations and so obviously in a rewilding context or a a restoration context, it's really important to think about those um, ecological aspects of restoration. Um, as I mentioned, the decline, uh, primarily caused by hunting and persecution um, and habitat loss. Um, and they used to be spread across Britain, um, but went extinct in England and Wales by the 1800s. And so Scotland was uh, has for a long time been considered to be the last um, stronghold. Um, and really the population was at a low point in the early 1900s. And there, then was some re-expansion um, and then again, some decline, uh, probably because of um, increased efficiency at persecution method or methods. So um, particularly as, as it, um, improved methods in hunting like um, uh, better lamps um, and uh, now night vision technology and things like that um, have arisen. Um, they weren't legally protected um, until 1988. Um, and then another threat that faces them is hybridization or interbreeding with wild cats and domestic cats. Um, the off offspring are capable of interbreeding with either species. Um, and this is, a, this is a threat that faces the population. Scotland is the most hybridized population in Europe. Um, this is a recent uh, data um, summary, summarized in a recent paper produced by our team. Um, and really every cat in the wild um, that you find in Scotland is a hybrid. Um, and that paper was just released uh, last week and you can find it in current biology if you want to read a bit more about it. I'm not going to dwell on that now. Um, and so the, the aim of saving wild cats really is, you know, ultimately to res restore uh, wild cats to landscape across Scotland. And also it's very important that um, and we maintain that strong connection um, with people. Um, and the, the methodology that we're using is conservation breeding for release of the species. Um, the project is in two halves. Um, the first half is everything to do with pre pre preparing the ground for the release. So that includes getting um, the conservation breeding population into a situation where it's able to be released um, and also ensuring that the site um, for release is suitable. Um, and then those two things culminated in the trial trial release, which happened um, in June uh, this year. Um, our approach is informed by um, various best practice guidelines. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, um, particularly the, the code for reintroductions and other conservation translocations put out by the IUCN. And here in Scotland, we have our own uh, Scottish version of the code. Um, we've got none of these uh, species recovery projects um, happen in uh, isolation. Um, I think a general theme is uh, big teams and big partnerships and a lot of different skills that need to come together. Um, and this is our team, um, which, which we're uh, hugely grateful to. And I think you'll see that um, a theme of this presentation will be um, a lot of partners. And I don't believe that species recovery efforts um, are, ever happen uh, through one person or one organisation alone. It's extremely important to get uh, people to work together and to bring together a lot of different disciplines and skills in order to achieve success. Um, so I'll just talk to you a little bit about the um, conservation breeding side of the project first. So we established a conservation breeding for release centre um, at 
uh, Highland Wildlife Park, which is in the north of um, the Highlands and close to the release site. Um, and we did that by taking animals from across the breeding program of UK zoos and wildlife parks. Um, and those animals are, are paired in breeding enclosures, which you can see here on the, on the picture. Um, and the kittens are then moved into larger pre-release enclosures um, at around five to six months of age. Um, and this is just an aerial shot of the facility. This facility was built in the last couple of years. It was supported, obviously, by, by um, the, the grant from the European Union and, and, and all of our project partners. Um, and um, it was quite a challenge to build it during the pandemic, as I'm sure some of you might uh, uh, empathise with. Um, but basically, um, the cats uh, are moved from the the kittens are moved from these enclosures in the bottom uh, left hand side of the the picture um, into larger open topped naturalistic enclosures, um, where they are prepared for uh, life in the wild. Um, we model our approach very much on that of the Iberian Lynx project. We're hugely grateful to have the partnership of Jinta Andalusia, um, and we've learned a huge amount uh, from people uh, in Spain and Portugal. Um, and uh, uh, it's been really, really great to have their, their partnership and help in terms of informing every aspect of the project. Um, and obviously, the, the purpose of the breeding enclosures is really this. Um, to produce uh, baby wildcats, um, which we have done quite successfully. Um, and so these kittens are the kittens that will be, uh, that have been then released into the wild. Um, in terms of how we manage things in the pre-release enclosures, um, we do a very hands-off approach. Um, we use um, video surveillance. Uh, this is uh, David Barkley here, um, who's in charge of the Exit Tube Breeding Programme. Um, overseeing the, the enclosures and we have uh, various uh, large climbing frames and things like that within the enclosures to encourage natural behaviour. Um, and we are doing a variety of different um, uh, uh, kind of behavioural measures um, to try and understand more about the individual personality of the cat. Um, and this is just the sort of thing um, that we can see with the video cameras um, in the pre-release enclosures, we're able to uh, do focused watches of individual animals um, and uh, kind of really check up on them. And it allows us to do a much more hands, hands off approach to management. Um, so obviously in parallel, and whilst that was all going on uh, with, our, with our conservation breeding team, uh, we needed to be checking that we had uh, a place to release um, cats into. And I think this is probably a real theme of projects like this, um, that you have to get um, conditions in captivity and conditions in the wild right at the same time. They've both got to come, come online at the same time. So very grateful to our field team led by Dr. Kerry Langridge um, that uh, spent a huge amount of time preparing the ground. Um, and their role really was to assess the release site um, in terms of um, a whole wide range of criteria, prepare it in terms of conducting some threat mitigation. And then these, the team are now busy out uh, monitoring the first batch of released wildcats. Our release site is the Cairngorms Connect landscape. We're hugely grateful to Cairngorms Connect for their partnership. This is a really bold and ambitious 200-year uh, vision to enhance habitats and species across um, uh, a number of landowners in the Cairngorms National Park. Um, the site was chosen because it covers a large number of Natura areas, which is one of the um, criteria for uh, life projects, eat life projects. Um, and it has um, uh, 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 enough suitable wildcat habitat to support um, a, a viable wildcat population. At least that's what the, um, the theory tells us. Of course, in practice, we won't know that until um, we've seen how the releases go. Um, the field team are out doing ecological surveys and monitoring um, and a whole variety of different things, including um, running a huge amount of camera trap um, surveys across a kind of fixed grid, um, which allow us to assess a whole variety of things, including the presence of um, feral uh, domestic cats um, and other um, prey species and mesocarnivores. And we've we've analysed a huge number of camera trap images to date um, in terms of generating that data. And that, that array has been uh, run now for, uh, we're in the third year of running that. Um, from that information, we're able to get a variety of different um, in, um, information, 
uh, to help us really plan uh, the release. Um, the team also run uh, have been running a, a variety of um, uh, uh, surveys around prey species because, of course, again, it's really it's really important we we gain a lot of understanding of of what um, uh, the the cats are, are eating. Um, and we're very lucky actually because this area has long term data sets of prey species that have been gathered through the Cairngorms Connect Predator Project. So it's a very good place to um, conduct this release into. The camera track way are also looking for um, uh, feral cats and hybrids um, and the site was chosen because it has a very low number of cats but um, it was important to identify any target animals that might need to be um, neutered. Um, most of the cats we identified were actually pet cats um, that had already been uh, neutered and re rehoused through a huge amount of work that's been done by cats protection in the area over many years. Um, and we record all of the cats in the release site in our catalogue, which we, we think is a very witty name for it. Um, and basically, we have a sort of kind of total overview of all the, the cats in the release area. And as I said, if we find any cats that are unmuted, um, uh, that are not pet pet cats, um, then uh, we conduct cat mute vaccinate release, um, which is the strategy uh, that's used in Scotland for, for dealing with feral cats. And this is just one of our team. Um, releasing a cat uh, after it's been um, subjected to TMVR. It's also great because we are able to conduct disease surveillance and genetic testing on these animals and gather a, a real picture of what's going on uh, with the cat population in the wild. And we know that disease transfer from domestic cats is probably uh, a threat. Um, and it's, in, it's a threat to cat populations across Europe, not just um, here in Britain. Uh, we do a lot of um, uh, messaging uh, with local people around responsible cat ownership. Um, we've got a really high understanding of that in the local area because we've had uh, wildcat projects working here for the last uh, more than a decade. Um, but uh, we definitely one of the things that's really important. Um, before we started the releases, we, we did a lot of community engagement. Initially, this was quite challenging because of COVID. I'm sure many people on this call would be uh, familiar with that theme. Um, but we, um, we've been surveying people on their attitudes to responsible cat ownership and also um, for the release in general. Um, we've done a various um, local engagement activities with the community. Um, it's very important and it takes up, up a lot of time, but obviously it's really critical in terms of gaining support. And we also work with a variety of local businesses um, and kind of tourism operators in the area because wildcats are still very much part of the the kind of local narrative in terms of wildlife. Although when you speak to people, most of them haven't seen one in, in about 30 years, although many people have a story about them. Um, they feature on clan crests uh, locally, um, so they're quite an important part of Scottish culture. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what's happening with my slides flicking. Um, but we, we've also worked a lot with uh, landowners. Um, we've conducted drop-in sessions and informal interviews with more than 50 landowners in, in and around the release area I and mean, of course that's really important in terms of um, uh, minimizing ongoing uh, potential risks and, and, and really trying to generate a, a kind of collaborative dialogue around that. So those two things came together um, we were we, we provided a lot of that evidence to uh, receive our translocation license from Scottish government and then um, they came together in the trial releases in June. Um, the release methodology that we used was a soft release methodology. So the cats were moved from pens, uh, our pre-release pens, to small pens at the release site. Um, and they were released in uh, June and September. Um, and all of the cats were collared. Um, and we released them in several different cohorts. Um, and now the task of the team is really to, to follow everything that they do. And we're learning a huge amount. Um, we use uh, radio GPS collars to monitor all their movement. These have been used uh, hugely across uh, Europe um, and we, we've collaborated a lot through the Euro Wildcat Network um, to understand a lot about how to uh, manage and develop this project. So it's a really just a flag to that network. It's been a really great tool for all of us um, and we're very grateful to the many collaborators uh, there. Um, and the the data is stored on collars in the in and, and then da manually downloaded in the field. Um, and so this is this is a picture of one of the first cats uh, coming out of um, its release enclosure. 
um this was in june um the 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 doors were opened at four in the morning and then the cats are allowed to uh with very few people present um just two two members or three members from the team and then the cats are allowed to come out at their own time and we we have these high up um doors so that they aren't um uh, harassed by other um meso predators or, or dogs or or fewer other meso predators or dogs and and that would say that we can do some supplementary feeding on the platforms if necessary um and just a picture of one of the cats uh yeah sneaking out um early in the morning uh and then um taking its first steps into the wild um kind of wondering what might be going through its head here um yeah but obviously uh that was a really really exciting moment for the team to see that and uh yeah it was uh, one of those pinch yourself moments because it's taken um really decades of partnership working to get to this stage in scotland um so yeah, very very emotional and and great um, to to do that. And of course, you know that's just the beginning. Um, we know that uh, life in the wild is is really tough for carnivores um, everywhere. You know globally. Um, and so everything now, our job is to learn everything we can from the released cats. So we released nineteen wild cats in the summer. Um, to date, eighteen of them are alive. Um, and we've been able to follow really everything that those cats do. Um, we're planning further releases for 2024 and 2025. And the million dollar question is, uh, will we manage to establish a wildcat population at the release site? Um, winter is coming, there's snow on the ground here. Um, we can have very, very variable weather conditions here in winter in Scotland because of our oceanic climate and perhaps also the influence of climate change. Um, winters can be very snowy or very wet um, and anything in between and so probably that will have a, a big impact on on the um, wildcat survival and uh, yeah one of the great things is we've seen evidence of them uh, hunting in the wild and we know um, that they're able to do that um, because they're clearly um, following them with the GPS collars now and the amount of time they've been out in the wild, we're, we're very uh, confident that they've, they've got those, those good skills. Um, but obviously with all, with all carnivores, it's going to be about maintaining that energetic balance and finding food as they, as they go through winter. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really all uh, from us. Um, but I just want to, as I said, um, it takes a, you know, a global village, I think, to recover a species and, um, we're hugely grateful to um, yeah, Rewilding Europe and the European Comeback Fund and all of our other funders um, and partners um, and all of the zoos and wildlife um, uh, facilities that hold wildcats and our many, many specialist advisors, some of whom probably haven't made it onto this list, so apologies. Um, we've had lots of volunteers help us. Um, and yeah, thank you for listening. Um, we have a a newsletter that comes out every two months and um, you can sign up to it um, through the Saving Wildcats website and we also have a bunch of other ways you can support us directly if you want to including uh, sponsoring uh, one of our cats so please um, check that out. Uh, thank you so much Rewilding Europe.